You already had a chance to meet Danny Graham, who will be joining us here in this panel, and I think many of you know uh, Rankin and Sweeney, you do on. So in a moment, uh, they'll have an opportunity to share with you uh, some of their thoughts with regard to this question. My name is Phil Davison, and I work with the St. X Extension Department. Um, but before I start, I'm going to show up just two slides. That's it. That's the only PowerPoint piece that we have for this. Uh, we'll try as much as possible to engage you in a conversation. So before I begin, and if you have a piece of paper and a pen, if you don't, you can borrow it from someone else. But a piece of paper and a pen. And um, if your art skills aren't that good, this is okay. <laughs> you can get someone else to draw what I actually draw. You can just draw a, a really big light bulb in the middle of that piece of paper. Now, I'll just tell you what you'd like to do with that now. So draw a really big light bulb on the middle of that piece of paper. Really big light bulb. Oh, wow, that's great. Everybody's got a nice big light bulb, a piece of paper, and okay. Turn the piece of <laughs> turn the piece of paper over. You could put it on the other side. Now there will be an activity where I'm going to ask you. You're not going to share this uh, publicly necessarily, but uh, you will end up sharing this with someone else. So if this if this part that I'm going to ask you, you don't want to participate in, that's okay. But if there is a mailing address that you can use that someone could send this light bulb to. So a mailing address on the back of that piece of paper. Back of that piece of paper. Is that a mailing address? Maybe it's just some random person. So anyone that, actually that's a great idea. So anyone in Nova Scotia that you know of should receive this light bulb. So as this discussion unfolds, um, in that light bulb, I would uh, encourage you, like you, to write down at least one, but you can write as many as you want. You can draw more light bulbs or a bigger light bulb, that's okay. Uh, but one idea that comes to you with regard to how we should move forward. We've, we've, we've had a lot of discussion here in the last couple of days. You've heard Andy talk about the Engage uh, discussion. Many of you have either read or been part of some of the one other social discussion. So just one or a number of ideas that you think are you'd like you could see us moving forward. And I would ask you to do this when you do that. Um, make sure it's something that you can be involved with. Uh, from my 50 plus years of growing up in Nova Scotia, I know that it's very tempting to write down ideas that someone else should do. These are ideas that you could be involved with. You see yourself as, you might not play a central role in that, you work collaboratively with other people, but that you would say, yeah, I, I, I would be involved with that, that's something I would do. So hold that thought for the end. At the end, I'll tell you, we're going to do something with the pieces of paper. Um, we have heard a lot uh, over the, the past day and a half about the number of ways in which we can move forward. And uh, so I thought what I would do is reference two pieces of information that has been shared. First is related to the Anti-Dish Movement. Um, as the director of the Extension Department, um, my first uh, encounter um, at St. Rex, so one of the others, my first encounter was with some of my colleagues, Paul and Matt, and she's sitting here. But shortly after that, at a public meeting, I met a very diminutive uh, nun. Polly knows who she is. And uh, she and I had worked together previously doing literacy work in Kensal a long period of time before that. And she said to me, Phil, it's great to see you. Um, I said, thank you. And uh, she was, you know, she's about this tall. And she said, uh, I hope um, you realize whose shoulders you're standing on. Well, said, so you were holding the position that uh, Father Cody had. I hope you realize the shoulders that you're standing on. And at that moment, she became this tall, <laughs> and I became this tall. And I realized in doing that work and growing up in Nova Scotia that a lot of what we talked about here, and a lot of these uh, ideas, we're not recycling ideas because they're always new ideas, but we do need to honor that tradition, that past, and respect that. So 
The ammunition movement has been referenced in almost every session that I've been in. So I thought it would be appropriate to at least remind us of that past, particularly the principles that came out of that movement. But these are principles that Moses Cody himself or his cousin Jimmy, neither one of them ever actually said these things. So remember, these are principles that were shared uh, during a convocation with us in 1944 Haiti, which is kind of interesting. But these principles have been talked about and used and have helped inform our discussions in social enterprise and innovation locally, regionally, and around the world. So let's start off with just a, a short refresher on those. Now, um, in typical sort of 1944 fashion, these are written as very declarative statements. Primacy of the individual, there's six of them. So the primacy of the individual, um, the part of the movement that really allowed it to move forward was the notion that everyone had an opportunity to contribute their gifts. They had a chance, they had something to say. They were valued. If you didn't have a space or an opportunity for people to be valued and to be able to share that, um, then they really couldn't participate as active citizens. And so one of the, the early successes of the movement was that it focused on this. It gave people the spaces to participate as citizens. Secondly, that effective social reform involves fundamental change in social and economic institutions. From our first keynote that we had through a number of the other sessions that we've had here, we have talked about the fact that some of the institutions that we currently have don't work, that they need to change. Um, and the movement was successful during those, especially up until about the 1950s, because it recognized that these institutions had to change. And it did challenge those institutions and work with and work beside them, but also challenged the ones in many of those institutions. Education must begin with the economic. From the kitchen table conversations, to the mass meetings, to the world conferences, throughout all of those discussions ran a thread of uh, economic um, literacy, helping people understand how to become masters of their own destiny. It had to begin with the discussion regarding the control of their own economies. And education must be through group action. This was never a movement that was led by individuals. It was always a collective enterprise, from its early days all the way through. Social reform must come through education. So education, in its broadest sense, as a learning venture, was a central part of the movement, always a part of the movement. Learning all occurred in every single setting when people came together. It was always a chance to hear what's going on elsewhere. What else can we learn from? How can we learn from our neighbors? How do we know what's going on elsewhere in the world? With the hope that we could have a full and abundant life for all. What a wonderful way to close out the six principles. In listening to our discussion over the last couple of days, um, I was, in the last 10 minutes, <laughs> trying to think of a way to summarize some of what has come out of some of those discussions, but also in responding to the question of what do we do next? How do, how do we move forward? Now, there are lots of very specific actions that we'll talk about, and you're going to light bulb some of those as we go through here. But conceptually, there are, at least for me, trying to put this together, and it is Friday, <laughs> so to try to TGIF, uh, how we might move forward. The first is trust. Um, in almost every session that I have been part of here, I've heard that word used in different ways. Whether it's trust between communities um, in this province who haven't necessarily worked together, and there's a whole reason for that, and Danny outlined some of those in his presentation. Uh, whether it's trust that we need to establish uh, between communities and their First Nations communities, where there's trust that we need to establish uh, between us and our politicians. The trust is the only currency that matters. There's lots of other currencies, but at the end of the day, if you don't have this, you cannot start. You can't start it. One of the key things about the Indian Initiative is this is where it started. It started by building trust, and that comes from coming together. 
it often gets sidelined because it seems like a very bland, or not bland, <laughs> a very sort of overarching statement that really doesn't have anything. What, what does that mean? What it means that we work to do that. We go out of our way and see any time to go to build bridges. We go out of our way to ensure that people are involved in these conversations. Second is gifts. Um, remember that we all have gifts. We all have gifts to bring. And we need the spaces and the discourse that enables us to contribute. Now, someone mentioned, I think it was the last question that was raised at the end, was about seniors. Um, my mother, I grew up in Oxford in Cumberland County. Thanks, Danny, for putting that slide up there. On a farm, my mother still lives on the farm. And she is, um, as my dad, my dad would say she's full of this and vinegar. My uh, brother would say she's a spark plug. Uh, but you get a, a picture of who she is. And one of the things that she's increasingly annoyed with is the way in which she is portrayed in public discourse. This is a woman who's was a teacher, has led an active life, and she says, every time I pick up the paper, I read about myself. I read about seniors and how they're a drain on the economy and that we have this huge demographic time bomb in this province. I never once read about the fact that all the things I did in my life to contribute or the ways in which I might contribute, the ways in which I could contribute. Um, you work at the Extension Department. <laughs> and you know how change that discourse? And so I've been reminded in the discussions that I've had in communities to watch the way I talk. Just to be careful about how we portray that. When we release demographic information, the one Nova Scotia report did this and others, it's, it's fine to kind of portray that, but portray the demographics in an alarmist fashion that essentially wipes away a whole portion of our province is pretty damaging. And, and doesn't acknowledge the fact that these are folks who, and I'm assumed to be one of them, it's not just gray here, it's no hair too, um, that we have a lot to contribute and want to contribute. So we do need the discourse and the spaces to make sure that that happens. Investments, <laughs> talk a lot about that. We need to make investments, in my view, and looking at what the Anagation Movement did as well, and what we already have and can do so that our have not provincial narrative becomes a have much. Um, there's the, the old adage of, you know, is the glass half empty or half full? Well, in fact, it's both. But you can't do much with the half empty piece. Acknowledge it, you can't do much with it. So investing in that other half full piece is important. Um, I have a, a very short illustration of that. So, again, because um, where, where my mother lives, we grew up on a lake. There's a nice lake behind our house. And last year, um, there was a lot of ice on the lake in March, and there was a huge rainstorm. I don't know how many people remember the big rainstorm. But this lake's been there for at least 100 years. And at the end of the lake, what controls its uh, depth is um, an old water wheel dam. The water wheel's long since gone. <laughs> But part of the dam is still there, the stuff was grabbing and so forth. As a result of this rainstorm, the uh, dam blew out, just blew out. And over the period of the next month, the water level in that lake diminished by a foot, by two feet, by three feet. Now, this is a lake that is three miles long and a half mile wide. So that is a lot of water, which we know that lake. Um, I had nightmares or dreams. I'd wake up that I would. I was a kid and I'd walk back down the lake and there's no water. <laughs> Just a little stream. Why did you brought all this stuff in? It's in here. So, uh, in typical Nova Scotia fashion, my cousins said, um, we can fix that. We'll take the dump truck up there and the front end loader and we'll start to dump a bunch of stuff in the end. Someone got wind of that and said, you can't do that. You're not allowed to do that. Um, we have to do an engineering study to figure out how to control that. In the meantime, a, an asset that has been there for 100 years drains away. And what was most discouraging was watching people say, well, you know what, I guess we can't. I, I guess we can't. 
It was, it was sort of a metaphor of standing, watching the assets of a small world moving away, and you know, putting things in buckets and turning away and say, well, we were told we can't, so we, we can't. Well, thankfully, uh, there were two enterprising beavers that were in the way, that's right, who had other plans. Raise a family, <laughs> do something, I don't know what to do. And uh, they built the dam. So I was there about a month ago. So I, I visit my mother about every week, or every second. I was there about a month ago, and I'm happy to say the lake is back up. It's about two feet. It's still a foot lower. There is a beautiful beaver dam there. And at midnight, about a month ago, my two cousins went up with the dump truck and dumped a big load of snakes <laughs> in the dam, just to make sure that the dam didn't blow up. My point is that we need to invest in what we already have. We have wonderful assets. And I tell that story because it is an illustration of what I've experienced. I know the young initially we struggled with this, Father Cody talked about that. By watching our assets drain away and not investing in them, we need to focus on those. It's a good place to start. The final part of the teaching I have is forms and focus. <laughs> I was trying to figure out the math. I only had 10 minutes to get this together a few months ago, so I was trying to figure out what that else should be. So you can help me out. I don't know if this is the right one. But, um, find ways to learn from each other, share ideas and that, and collaborate. So I know that um, we can get tired of coming together sometimes and continuing to talk, but we really, we've been having this discussion for a long time, but in many ways we're just getting started. We, we have forgotten how to converse with one another in some ways. Uh, we need to come together face to face. We need to find ways to be more inclusive. Uh, Danny was absolutely uh, right on when he said that you know, who is not in the room. I, I'm always cognizant of in this space on a Friday during the day that I'm paid to be here, as are a number of folks in this room. But there are a lot of people who can't be here because they're, they just can't get the time off work. They can travel here, they can participate. And so while that's we still need to do these things, we also need to make sure that we're holding our events and, and offering our consultations in ways that a lot of other folks who can't uh, take the time to be part of this discussion are able to do that. And I applaud uh, engages uh, wiki suggestion, which allows people to engage and also their event that allowed 900 people from their homes to be able to take part and run that conversation. So I uh, put these two slides up two stories just to kind of get things going and also give Danny some space <laughs> to think of it. I'm going to turn it over to Rankin and uh, let him offer some uh, some observations and then to Danny and as we continue along please start jotting down some things in your work box and we'll talk about those in a moment. Thanks.
Danny, um, I, I've gotten to know Danny the last couple of years, and um, so I, I get to witness him um, a fair bit because of a couple of things we do together. And um, uh, to, to witness uh, Danny's ability to unpack and pack incredibly complicated issues and to take others along with him uh, when he's doing that um, is just a sight uh, to be told. Um, and so that has been part of my privilege of, as of late. You know that, that line about, uh, that wonderful line about Robert Sandville they used to say that he was the best prime minister that we never had. Um, I, 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 I suspect that Danny Graham will forever be known as the best premier that we've ever had. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sad that he's not the premier. I'm glad where he is now. It all worked out. <laughs> Remember that story about with the guy, you know, that was walking along the path and he, he slipped and he, and, he, and he was going down and he grabbed his little tree and hanging on to it. And the abyss, you can't see the bottom of the abyss. So he lets go, it's over. And uh, so he's hanging on, kind of getting a sense of how desperate it is. And he, he called out, is there anybody there? <laughs> Nothing. So he waits a few minutes and he calls out again. Is there anybody there? And then there's, there's a voice. He says, yes. And the uh, guy says, uh, what will I do? Can you help me? And the voice says, uh, yes, I can help you. And then the guy says, well, who are you? And the voice says, I'm God. Well, what will I do? He says, let go. It'll be fine. The guy waits a minute and then he calls out, is there anybody there? <laughs>
and would announce some grand announcement. Um, and, and, and the community would turn out and be a lovely uh, moment, and there'd be lots of clapping, and uh, it would be all dressed up. And um, and kind of the, it would be dressed up in such a way that it would it would kind of be announced, this is it. This is the turn in the road. Now, now clearly, I mean, number one, that's sort of what politicians do. That's the nature of the beast. And when you're a desperate community, you really want to believe in it. So it was sort of this silent conspiracy that we agreed on between the people and the politicians. Now, now, the thing was, if you use a metaphor of a house, it was really like the house, what was really going on, though, was the house was on fire, the house was burning. And the announcement would be, the politician would come in and kind of announce, say, he'd announce new wallpaper for the children's bedrooms. <laughs> and everybody would say, oh my God, it's beautiful wallpaper. <laughs> And, it, and, it, and if, if somebody tried to say, right, but the house is burning, <laughs> somebody would say, shh, don't you like the wallpaper? <laughs> Show some appreciation, for God's sake. <clears throat> Do you know when you're, uh, you know when you're, when you're dying, of the work that's been done in terms of those stages of death, um, including you know, denial, blaming, depression, bargaining. Um, I'm not sure if communities are exempt from that. I, I think. I think. Um, when you're a community that's dying, um, perhaps you deny it for a long time. And maybe then you blame. Um, and I and I'm sensing, I'm sensing um, that we're moving to another place. Um, we're moving to this place as a community wherein the understanding is we're dying and we accept that. And there's nobody coming. There's nobody coming to save us. There's just us. So we either lay down and die one by one and alone, or we stand together and see if we can find a new way. I think this has been a remarkable gathering. Um, both, well, first of all, my, my friend, my old friend, Mike Lewis, has been telling me for years it's all about the context. What's the context? And then, both he and Dan, in their keynotes, really what they were doing was saying, this, this is about, this is about us. This is about organizing. This is about stepping up. And there's all kinds of questions of how, of how we're going to do that. I, I, I think people figured that out. One of the things some of you might know, I ran for mayor back in 2012. And I say now that on my resume I have another thing there, failed politicians down that list. But what was, what was interesting, when you're, running, when, you, when you're in that position, uh, part, part of what was quite striking was, it suddenly kind of 
people and the media seem to kind of assume that you're suddenly filled with no understanding and wisdom of what's to be done. So they ask you questions like, uh, uh, are you supposed to respond intelligently to things like, well, how are we going to uh, develop uh, this community economically? How are we going to revitalize the town of Lewisburg? Uh, where, where and how should we rebuild the library uh, that's in Sydney? And I, I always remember one group, I met one group of, of elders, and they said to me, and what are you going to do about the issue of the boardwalk? I had no idea what the issue of the boardwalk was. <laughs> <coughs> um, now, I, I got into that. I mean, I probably was a terrible probably mistake I made. I got into that in terms of thinking I should have answers to these, so I would kind of be responding in my, in my best attempt to sound intelligent. Um, the reality was, the reality was, I, 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 I didn't know how to solve any of those problems. That was the reality. All I knew to do was the same thing I've done with New Dawn for almost 35 years. And that's what you do is you keep gathering up people, most of whom are a lot smarter than I am. And you ask them if they'll have a look at that and see what they can figure out. And they do that. They do that. That's the story of New Dawn. That's the story of community-based development. You take a group of people and you, and you encourage them or you inspire them or you ask them or you beg them to begin to imagine another possibility. And imagination is the most powerful and wondrous thing we have. So we're at this, we're at this, we're at the abyss, there's no doubt about it, we're at the abyss in Cape Breton. And, you know, I guess it could go either way, but by God, I'm feeling good. I'm just feeling so good. Now look, in terms of, in terms of the Nova Scotia context, in terms of one Nova Scotia, do you know, I'm going to tell you two things that I think were fundamental. One was that the Ivory group, they announced, they announced where we are. They announced the edge of the abyss, now or never. That's pretty clear, that's pretty plain. So now uh, it's clear not only is Cape Breton dying, the province is dying. That's, that's the hard reality. I'm not sure if we as a, as a province fully understand that, but that's the reality. When you look at the data, that's the reality. I think the other incredibly significant thing that happened was when they, when they presented that report, they did not present it only to the government of Nova Scotia. They presented that report to all Nova Scotians. As Danny inferred, we've done one of those reports every 10 years since the 1930s. In each instance, it went to the government. It was sort of like giving it to me when I was running for mayor. It, it was, it doesn't work. That's, that's our, that's our responsibility. Now somebody said earlier today, you know, we're preaching to the converted here. We are. We are. You, you're the people, you're the people that have some road behind you in terms of knowing about being organized, knowing about gathering people together, knowing about imagining, and knowing about how the world is going to have to work in the 21st century. So I guess, not only do I feel hopeful and optimistic, I am, I am, um, I am excited to be able to say, this is it. This is the moment. Let's take it. Thank you very much. Desire to go after rain <laughs> uh, in regards. So I'm 
Greece. Uh, just to sort of, um, um, I, I, I guess I, I also want to just pay personal homage to that friendship that Rankin spoke about. I had heard of Rankin's name for a long period of time, but didn't get to know him for the last couple of years. And uh, when I think of reasons for us to have hope and reassurance that we're on the right path, it is when I spend time understanding somebody who is able to connect with us in our daily issues, but also carry a vision that is so enormous and that um, pulls all of this together and inspires so many people. It's just, it has been uh, an absolute treat, not just for me, but one of the things we both sit as members of the one and coalition and uh, uh, the work that he is doing. And I know that there's always this smile on his face, and I know that he's got sort of a Cape Breton tartan underwear on whenever he's <laughs> sharing his ideas about Nova Scotia. Um, and uh, that's uh, in part because he's been at this for longer than any of the other people who have been at the table in terms of synthesizing the ideas that uh, make, it, uh, make it all work. So, I, um, I, I, I will be uh, brief in my thoughts, and I'm going to try to build on part of what um, Rankin said. I, I, I'm struck each time I come, I, I, I spend time in different parts of the province where, and today would be an example here today, there would have been three or four people who came up and said, I knew your dad. Um, my dad passed away this past April. And I've spent a lot of time like, trying to make sense of his public and private life to a certain extent. He was, uh, he was in the Senate, he was a dying of old Kate Ratner, who just uh, loved this place so passionately. He, um, but there are other aspects of my dad's life because he lived in Ottawa for certain days of the week that almost created this sort of um, schism. Uh, if you will, in the way that he showed up. And it was a difficult thing, I think. Uh, it's, it's difficult to sort of, it's, it's, this, this is a, again, it hopefully it doesn't sound too metaphysical in the way that I'm trying to describe this, but um, the challenge for all of us is to see ourselves clearly, to know ourselves com as completely, to, to act with a sense of purpose. And when we see a world where everyone, uh, whether it was in my dad's case of the story of Ottawa and all the grand things that the Federal Liberal Party would be doing, and then coming back to Nova Scotia, there is a certain something that sort of has the potential to create a separation in the way that you sort of see yourself and your sense of purpose in this, uh, in, in, the, in the things that we do. He, he, he lived with purpose, but like the rest of us, it was like for him, or like, like for the rest of us, the way that we sort of watch television or heard, hear about Manhattan, or sometimes think about, you know, it seems that everybody else is doing so wonderfully in Alberta, that we start to have a, a certain sense of insecurity about not owning what we have and being proud of what we have. And all of which is to sort of try to say that, um, just like any individual who looks honestly at themselves in the mirror, a community that looks itself in the mirror no matter where you are, if they're really honest with themselves as a community, they'll find things that need fixing. That's just the reality of being flawed beings. But if you hold the gaze long enough, and you really dial into it, and you sort of, um, if you're true to it, then you'll also see something really wonderful. My belief is that the, um, the journey that we're all on individually is just a fractal of the journey that we're on as groups of people in different ways. And uh, so the invitation I think that we need to sort of work through is recognizing just how challenging it is in some areas and not sugarcoat it. Not blink in the face of the reality related to the fact that for generations, too many 
Cape Bretoners, Nova Scotians, have been going down the road to live, work, and raise families in other parts of the country or other places when they've wanted to do it here. That's the thing that makes me, that's the, that's the, that's the aspect of our history that gives me heartburn. And that's not for a moment to sound xenophobic about wanting to keep all of our young people here just for the sake of keeping them here. But we need to do a much better job of winning the net gain of having more people stay here. And I think that the way that's going to happen, the way forward, is going to be for us to realize that is a big and unacceptable flaw, challenge that we have. And if, just like an individual, and again, at the risk of sounding metaphysical, I think if we hold that gaze long enough, we are going to see something absolutely magnificent. This isn't to be Pollyanna-ish. Absolutely magnificent about what we have here in Nova Scotia. We asked, I didn't share these results, but you saw the 27% of people, 10 out of 10. Uh, we asked people what's, what's best about being here. They said it's the people, it's the sense of community, it's the beauty, it's the surroundings, it's the proximity to the ocean. And so many other things that just don't exist in many other places that sort of brings us to this magical land. And so as we look at ourselves as individuals and say, you know, oh yeah, you know what? I've been screwing up in this area. We're also going to find some amazing stuff. And I, and I absolutely believe that as, as, as a people, as Nova Scotians, now that we are sort of in the conversation about the, the, the real challenges, what is going to emerge is this clarity around purpose. It's why we ask the question, success for Nova Scotia means a growth in our quality of life, or a growth in our, our economy. And I think that there's a strong statement that those Christians are saying about it means quality of life. So the question we hold is, what does that mean for us? What's the target that we're pointing toward? And when we see that, we're going to reach back, and we're going to see many of the assets. When we talk about asset-based community development, we will see assets that have been blind. We will have the conversations like we did in Chester and these other places where people go, I can't believe the wonderful things that are happening already in our communities. You go to Tadamagushri, you go places like Anakinish, and you will find the most exciting things that are being done anywhere, but for some reason, we're hiding them under a rock. One of the principles that uh, Phil spoke about um, uh, concerning the Anakinish movement's principles, it was number five, was that social reform must come through education. And I believe that so deeply. And it's, it's at, every, at every stage of sort of measuring what results from education, you, you see such a, an incredible return. And the most obvious one of them relates to our formal education and training so that we are as productive as we reasonably can be in a workforce that gives back to society and our community and our children so that it becomes a sustainable ecosystem that is really vibrant. But it can't stop just at being formally educated and trained in some capacity. What we're inviting is for you to consider the possibility that this includes public education, where we actually come together in, we used to do it around fires and, and, and town, in, in town squares and in church basements, and we and in our grandparents' time, the greatest of our innovations came together as a result of coming together and creating public education that would be on the classroom, that actually had people sitting face to face, heart to heart, and saying, "Who's your brother's keeper? What does it mean to be your brother and sister's keeper?" Really simple stuff that in this cybered world and in all the other ways that we sort of separate, and this isn't to criticize it, we need to, we, we've sort of separated from, but we need to find our way back into the conversations that create education at a level where we really own the challenge, own the beauty, make a plan, and move it into action. That's what education fundamentally is, where we say, okay, and it's not enough just to have the conversation. What are the amazing things that we can do? I don't know how many of you would know about uh, an initiative. I'll just give you one simple initiative about a single person making a profound difference in the lives of others. It's called Hope Blooms. 
hook blooms in, was on the dragon's head, the real dragon's head. It, it was started by uh, uh, a woman from Myra Road, Jesse Jolimore, who saw that there were a group of young kids in, uh, around Uniac Square, the most challenging area in, uh, for crime, poverty, family dysfunction, in Halifax at least. Huge issues. And she started with the simple idea of inviting these young people to plant a garden in their neighborhood. And it has led to the most profound changes in that community that you could ever imagine. So across all those lines, you, you look at education results as a result of that, entrepreneurship, connection to the earth and soil and the environment, intergenerational communication, health of these young people, all of these things pouring from a bloody single person with one idea. How many of those ideas are sitting in the hearts and minds of Nova Scotians now? that if we just unlock and connect up to the possibilities of what will happen, will lead to a better place. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen, uh, and sometimes it takes way more than a single person, and Jesse has lots of help right now. But if we move gradually in that direction with a belief that we know who we are, we've looked in the mirror long enough, we're not going to get knocked off the puck of trying to be Korea, in, in its exact form, but recognizing that there are some terrific things about the Korean economy that we need to understand in the way that they plan. It's going to be a made in Nova Scotia kind of process that reflects and reinforces what we value the most. That's the possibility. We're not screaming for Wall Street to show up because, frankly, I wouldn't want that. But I want something more for my children who are running into an age and stage where they're going to be making choices about whether they stay here. We might not make it for them in time, but sure as hell for their children who have gotten around the corner and made the possibilities open up. And when we do that, everyone's going to start to come here and say, ha, ah, what happened there? They turned it around. I think it begins with this kind of fundamental conversation, the way that this conference has brought people together, and the way that everyone's doing the work that you're doing uh, all around this uh, province, certainly in a million different ways. Thanks very much.